two, one. All right, looks like we are live now. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining. Just making sure I've got the back end here to set up as well. So just making sure we're all ready to go, but it looks like we are live. So welcome everybody to USCA's Facts Only Friday. And we're here today with our special guest from the Pacific Legal Foundation. Very excited to uh, be talking private property rights issues and, and some other regulatory issues that have been impacting ranchers. <laughs> for as long as at least I've been around, and I'm sure even longer than that. But uh, we're also joined today by USCA's Region 1 Board of Directors, uh, Curtis Martin, who's a fifth generation Oregonian uh, and past president of the Oregon Cattlemen's Association. So uh, two, two great guests here today. Let's see. Looks like we've already got some folks tuning in. Good. Good morning, says Denny, even though it's uh, quite <laughs> into the afternoon now. So um, thank you all for joining. Oh, it looks like we might have lost Facebook, but we're still live on YouTube. Just a minute here. Sorry, y'all. Something has to go wrong every single time. <laughs> um, let's just check here. All right, it looks like we are still live, so I'm going to keep going. Um, Denny, if you can hear us in the comments, please let us know. We've got at least 15 folks tuned in, so um, if, if you can hear us, if you're out there, please do drop a little note in there so we know that we've got folks listening. It looks like we're doing fine on YouTube. Um, so we are good to go. Thank you all. Um, so yes, Facts Only Friday here with Pacific Legal Foundation Senior Attorney Tony Francois. Tony, you've been involved in these issues for so many years now, um, especially as it relates to the Endangered Species Act. Uh, the waters of the U.S. or WOTUS rule, um, and you've worked with several different cattle organizations, uh, the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, the Washington Cattlemen's Association, the California Cattlemen's Association, and then also individual ranchers, you said, in Wyoming, Idaho, Arizona, so really all across the western U.S., and um, we're very excited to learn more about what that all means here today, and for folks watching at home, please do drop your comments, your questions, your concerns in the comment box there. We're going to get to that at the top of the half hour here. Uh, but first, a short overview. I'm going to turn it over to Tony now to tell us a little bit more about all of this work that he's been doing. Sure. Thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate uh, being able to join you today. I'm a senior attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a national uh, nonprofit pro bono litigation center. Uh, we're headquartered in Sacramento, California, but we have attorneys and other staff all over the country. Uh, we are able to represent, through the generosity of our donors, uh, clients in disputes with state, local, and federal government um, without having to charge them uh, for that service. So we can provide pro bono legal representation that goes a long way to leveling the playing field when, when people are in disputes with, uh, with the government. Uh, we emphasize protection of private property rights uh, in our work. And in that capacity, I've had the, the pleasure over the last several years of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, working closely with a lot of state and local cattlemen's organizations uh, and individual ranchers, really on a wide variety of, uh, of types of cases. We've done some uh, for example, uh, challenges to uh, state um, wildlife protection regulations in California on behalf of the California Cattlemen's Association. Um, we've also done quite a bit of work 
e for a, a number of uh, uh, ranching organizations to protect them and their members um, in, in, in two major areas of federal law. Uh, one is the Endangered Species Act, and then the other is the Clean Water Act, or as you mentioned, the Waters of the United States rule. And so let me, let me just give you a, an overview of the kinds of work we've done uh, on endangered species work uh, or under the Endangered Species Act. And you know, I think it's important to sort of identify at the outset, uh, you know, I don't know that we've ever, I'm pretty sure we've never filed a case challenging the, you know, like the entirety of the, in the Endangered Species Act. In our experience, the, the difficulty that a lot of ranchers and other private property owners have with the Endangered Species Act is that it's kind of a blunt instrument. You know, pretty much everybody, I think, supports the, um, you know, the, the goal of uh, protecting endangered wildlife. Uh, but what people have experienced is that uh, in the hands of those who have other motives, whether it's to stop development or to impose a particular view of how agriculture should proceed, uh, they're able to use the Endangered Species Act to um, uh, interfere with pretty normal use of uh, private property, especially farms and ranches. So we've represented ranchers and ranching organizations um, in challenges all over the country to the designation of particular um, areas as uh, critical habitat. Uh, for endangered species, particularly, um, this seems counterintuitive, when there are none of the endangered species in the habitat that gets designated. So we recently won a case out of New Mexico in which the Fish and Wildlife Service had uh, designated a fairly substantial part of the Lincoln National Forest in the southwest New Mexico as a uh, critical habitat under the Endangered Species Act for jaguars. And you know, the only jaguars in New Mexico are at the dealership in Albuquerque. And you know, there, are, there are no actual jaguars in, in New Mexico. Um, but under some pressure from uh, environmental groups, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service have designated um, part, of, um, part of this area of Southwest New Mexico uh, under the Endangered Species Act as habitat for jaguars. And the practical effect of that is that even though there's no jaguars there, uh, if you're a public lands rancher and you need the necessary permits, either from the Forest Service or the BLM, to do range improvements, what would normally be a pretty straightforward approval of that winds up getting delayed um, through the, the lengthy bureau bureaucratic process of consultation between the grazing agency and the Fish and Wildlife Service only at the end to produce the predictable result that, well, this won't have any impact on jaguars because there aren't any jaguars there. So we're you know, pleased we were successful in, uh, in that suit. Uh, we've currently got challenges ongoing to um, habitat designations also in New Mexico for uh, what's been uh, identified as the New Mexico jumping meadow mouse. Uh, where those habitat designations, uh, amazingly, um, have the effect of fencing uh, ranchers out of their own stock water rights uh, on watering holes. And so it gives you an example of the kinds of uh, um, you know, ESA projects we've been working on. Uh, we've got a kind of a longstanding effort to uh, reform the critical habitat designation for Southwest Willow Flycatcher. Um, you know, as an example. So then I'll turn to the Clean Water Act and our, our main experience with the Clean Water Act is in a, the application of this, which is really intended to prevent factories and sewage treatment plants, uh, you know, and other large um, kind of industrial facilities from, um, you know, releasing untreated wastewater into rivers and lakes over the years, over the decades, the Environmental Protection Agency and the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, who jointly enforce the Clean Water Act, have uh, taken increasingly an increasingly broad view of what they regulate under the Clean Water Act. So there's a couple of things that uh, then come into play for, for farmers and ranchers. The first is that uh, you know, the statute regulates uh, discharges into, uh, quote, navigable waters. 
And, you know, I think most people, you know, even if English isn't your first, third or fourth language would, would say that navigable means must float boats, right? <laughs> and, and actually in our legal tradition, it's not just must float boats, but must be used or, or capable of being used uh, to transport goods and commerce. So obviously the Mississippi River and uh, its major tributaries, but uh, small creeks and you know smaller lakes that even if you couldn't um, you know pilot a, a watercraft on them uh, are not themselves navigable in our legal tradition in the sense that they are not used you know as highways of commerce. And yet the the agencies have adopted definitions and their regulations that stretch this concept of navigable to the point of breaking where, um, you know, we've done some cases for, uh, you know, a rancher in Northern California uh, who was, uh, has been the subject of a, uh, an army enforcement action for the last going on 10 years for plowing um, uh, a field to plant a wheat crop in it and the, the, the navigable waters that he uh, is, is being charged with having uh, polluted by running a plow through them are ephemeral ponds that uh, basically they're, they're you know, six to 12 inch deep depressions uh, in the clay soil uh, in that part of the state, which collect rainfall and then um, sit there for six weeks or so um, and then evaporate. So at the time that equipment is operating, it's, it's not just na not navigable, it's not even water. This is just bone dry ground in, uh, in June and July when you go out there and, and run equipment in it. And yet, um, you know, that particular rancher has, has had legal expenses as his largest expense item uh, for the last several years because he's got the army charging him with uh, uh, polluting a navigable water uh, by running a plow shank through a, a dry depression in the ground. So we've done a lot of work um, with farmers and ranchers and other property owners around the country trying to uh, beat back this uh, very over aggressive interpretation of you know, what, what are navigable waters. The consequence of which is that the permitting um, in order to you know, do fairly ordinary things in those uh, what the agencies consider to be navigable waters uh, is onerous to the point of being infeasible, uh, certainly for most farming and ranching operations. If you, uh, if you, this is about 15 year old information at this point, it probably needs to be updated by the federal government, but uh, you know, a 2004 study uh, found that the average cost of a, a Clean Water Act permit for, for these types of activities exceeds a quarter million dollars just in consulting costs just to get the permit and takes almost two years to get. So if you're the rancher that can afford a quarter million bucks and, you know, two years of wait time to, to go out and plow a field, uh, I'd like to meet you because that's <laughs> that sounds unique. So that's a, an overview of uh, the type of work we've been doing uh, with ranchers and ranching organizations around the country. Um, in 2019, uh, we had the opportunity to work with uh, with Curtis on um, uh, a case that we brought in uh, the state of Oregon, uh, challenging the 2015 uh, version of the Clean Water Act regulations. And we were successful in getting those regulations and joined in Oregon. And uh, I'll turn it over, if, if that's okay now, to Curtis to talk about the, uh, the type of operations that you know, he was interested in protecting and what he's got going on there. And, but the, uh, you know, the thing that really strikes me about it is that what he's got underway on his ranch is a, a very good example of kind of the high quality of environmental stewardship that most ranchers bring um, to their way of life and their work uh, that was being impeded by federal environmental regulation that, that would have prevented him from doing what I'll ask him to describe now. 
No, you're yeah. absolutely right. Uh, and it's so important to walk that compromise, right? You you mentioned it at the beginning, no one's against endangered species protection or you know recovery. No one's against these uh, conservation projects. So uh, Kurt, very excited to hear your, your side of the story here. Yeah, you bet. Well, I, um, along with Tony, I think this is a great opportunity to get this out there and, and, and appreciate Leah, your uh, enthusiasm for getting this brought forward because it's one of those things that really, I would say the majority of ranchers and farmers are not even aware of. And I'll just give a real brief background of where I'm at, what I do and lifelong rancher born into a ranching family in Eastern Oregon. And I hope that nobody can confuse that with the west side of Oregon that we often call the left side with in more ways than one that receive about 50 inches of rain uh, and your precipitation where I'm at uh, 11 to 13 inches of rainfall or moisture per year is about what we have to deal with. So consequently, uh, the management of our valuable resource being water is, is really critical for our operations to be even in existence. And so, yeah, um, I've started my, I guess I would say that water and the water issues uh, are were the catalyst that first and got me involved with uh, politics. And that would have been clear back in 1990 when at that time, uh, the new governor, John Kitzhaber came on board and there was a, really a, a thrust of uh, re-looking or re-evaluating how the water uh, usage was occurring in Oregon. And there was a very strong push by organizations other outside of agriculture to uh, put a higher value on in-stream purposes for water than what we do as ranchers uh, with irrigation water, which would be out of stream purposes, air, uh, you know, irrigation crop production, cattle production and so forth. So that was kind of my beginning in the political field. And I was pretty sharp edged back in those days. Like, uh, you know, if you think you're gonna to touch my water, there's gonna be some very uh, dire consequences <laughs> when we meet at the ditch bank or my diversion structure. Um, but anyway, so moving on forward from there, um, through the years, uh, it became increasingly uh, apparent that there was a, a, a lot of, political thrust and wrong information being relayed to society at large about what we were doing with our water resources that are the pollution and, and, and the misappropriation of water needed to be looked at. And so in Oregon, uh, it is one of the, the coastal states that seem to be prevalent on each side of the United States, does have a very left-leaning perspective on environmental and a quite wrong perspective of what the truth is when you really get out on the landscape. So having, going ahead and, and moving forward to where we're at now, to the federal side of things, the, the waters of the United States, you know, these are the fallout implications and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tony, but I think it dates back to 1972 or three when uh, at that time, President Nixon and Congress enacted the Clean Water Act and the legislation that, that came forward. And so these, these are the things that were well-intended, a lot like what Tony referenced in the Endangered Species Act. They're very well-intended policy, but what happens is they can totally be misconstrued uh, or misused uh, by organizations that have an outside agenda. So um, we have had a relationship with uh, Tony and the Pacific Legal Foundation for quite some time. And so uh, they needed to have a actual individual that could possibly show harm uh, to their operation if these regula regulations were implemented or maybe more appropriate to the fact that the ambiguity of how these regulations could be interpreted would be detrimental. So um, I said, sure, I, uh, we kind of thrashed it around a bit. Tony was very upfront in telling me what, you know, the, you know, what the, the, protocol would be. Um, I have no legal expertise or technical experience, so uh, really trusted his ability to, to lead me through this. And what was really uh, amazing with Tony and Pacific Legal Foundation is he actually came out, oh gosh, when was that, Tony? Then spring of 2019 or when, I can't even remember now when it was, 18? It was uh, <laughs> June or early July last year. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And actually, you know, not only uh, explaining, you know, verbally over the phone and visiting about it, but Tony took it upon himself to come out and actually visit my two different locations that uh, we were talking about. And so we gave Tony a very uh, on the ground, realistic approach to the stewardship, the management operations of what we're trying, what we were doing on both our rangeland intermittent streams, and then more of a, uh, then another view of a uh, uh, continual uh, tributary, the Powder River that runs through my property in two different locations. And I think it gave Tony uh, a perspective of the realism of, of what it would look like uh, for, for my operation, for me particularly. And um, I really appreciated that. So yeah, I was very pleased to be part of the team and and uh it's always uh i like winning <laughs> and so it was pretty when we went to portland and we came out of there with the injunction from uh judge mossman uh it was a fairly pretty significant win especially when you consider the um extremists uh prevalent view that exists here in oregon and 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 in a lot of our urban metropolitan areas that we were able to prevail but um Tony and his team had put together a great argument. Um, I, it was very, quite enjoyable. Um, there were some other, there was a organization there by, by the name of Columbia River Keepers that uh, are, uh, the Columbia, the river is the, what their uh, namesake kind of comes from. And, and they were there in person to uh, say that there was enough uh, exemptions within the Obama era regu regulatory aspect to not, there was nothing to worry about. Well, that was, couldn't be further from the truth. The ambiguity of the definitions that still exist today are very troublesome. Uh, you know, you can gloss it over, but if you have a activist entity and someone that wants to uh, start pushing forward with the litigation, it could severely impact every rancher, especially I don't, you know, I'm not familiar with the eastern side of the state or eastern uh, region of the United States, but just our common day-to-day uh, -day seasonal uh, normal practices would have been severely, could have been, could be severely impacted to basically take the, the, the way we manage our operations away from us and uh, put them in such a constrictive regulatory aspects along with the permitting and the licensing um it just uh, there's no way that it would have been workable so we continue along that pathway uh, anyway yeah i'm very very proud of the friendship that tony and i have and the relationship that we've established and uh looks sounds like maybe we're even going to continue down this pathway to hope, hopefully get further clarification on waters of the united states well, that was a great overview. And um, Curtis, like you said, can't stop loving that winning feeling. Uh, but if you if you go ahead and Google Curtis Martin, Oregon, you're going to come up with a bunch of great articles on all of the work um, that Curtis and Pacific Legal Foundation have been into. Um, there's also this this lovely article from the Tri-State Livestock News, which references your work with the uh, governor. Um, I, I, I love this title. It says, Rancher and Democratic Governor Come Together for the Good of the Land. Um, so a lot of great reading materials out there for you all out uh, watching us today to follow up on. But Curtis, I wanted to ask just real quick, how, how did you um, come to learn about the Pacific Legal Foundation? I think, uh, Tony, you guys have been around for something like 1973, I think. From That's my right. research, um, so quite some uh, a long time. But Curtis, how did how did you fall into um, into the sphere with them? Right. Well, being you know, all of our uh, natural resource organizations all have we great, we have great membership and and uh, great participation. But it's always very hard to come up with the dollar bills to uh, to to drive these things forward. That we we realize they need to be recognized and dealt with and and not just, uh, uh, you know, let, let be steamrolled by them. And so 
gosh, you know, I can't specifically say how uh, Tony and I got together, but you know, as an organization, I was the I was the water committee resources chair for Oregon Cattlemen's for probably 25 years, and so consequently, when you're dealing in those specifics, you know, you you get to uh, to know organizations that are of like-minded uh, purpose, and then you you start reaching out and you you recognize that there are thank goodness uh, there are entities out there that are able to step up and assist in the technical aspects of this and then what's really outstanding with Pacific Legal Foundation is as I mentioned they're willing to invest the time and travel and effort to really not only just look at it from a black and white what's on paper perspective but also to come out and actually see the relevance of, of what the impact could be so that was that was the connectivity uh, to begin with with Pacific Legal Foundation was that we needed an entity. Um, Oregon Cattlemen's, of course, like most many organizations, didn't have the, the capacity financially to have an attorney, a natural resources attorney on uh, retainer. And so I guess I think that's pretty much how we started making communications together. That's awesome. Um, and it sounds like a great lesson in getting involved too, because of your involvement with the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, because of your involvement on the policy committees, you, you kind of fell into, you know, or, or learned more about some of the resources that are out there. So this is my midway plug for those of you to joining in tonight to become a member of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Curtis actually sits on our Public Lands and Environment Committee um, it's certainly a committee that um, has been very active lately with a lot of the issues that are happening in the western part of the U.S., increased wildfires. Um, I think Colorado is just now past the introduction of wolves in their state, the reintroduction of wolves in their state. Um, and uh, U.S. Forest Service issuing, you know, public comments or public uh, comment opportunities, rather. So uh, this is my midway plug here. Become a member of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. You can see Curtis is rocking that hat there. And also, um, in, in terms of getting involved, Tony, I noticed there's a button on your website. It says, submit your case here. What, if somebody's having, a, you know, an issue on their own, what, what can they do to reach out to you? How do they get in, how do they get in contact? Well, the, the, the first and easiest thing to do is that submit a case uh, resource on our webpage. So all the submitted inquiries go through a screening process and uh, a lot of them actually get looked at and examined by, uh, by individual attorneys on our staff. Um, and a, a certain number of our cases do come from those public inquiries. I mean, as a nonprofit organization, we, we obviously have, uh, you know, non-infinite resources and, um, so we, we, we focus on uh, kind of two types of things uh, or, or two criteria for our cases. Uh, one is that they're cases that we can, we can litigate in an efficient way that um, then will establish a legal precedent that will be helpful for not just the individual uh, person or entity or company that we represent, um, but everybody similarly situated. Uh, and that's so you, you may hear the term strategic limit. Li, the, <laughs> you may hear me try to speak clearly. Yeah, you may you might hear people use the term strategic litigation, and that's what that really refers to: is to uh, identify cases that um, will help the person who's got the particular problem, but will establish uh, or clarify a legal principle that will be uh, useful for for many many people. So a really good example of that. Uh, many years ago, our first Supreme Court win, uh, or our second one, excuse me, um, had to do with local government uh, in California, uh, or a state agency, excuse me, uh, demanding that somebody give up a, a property easement as a condition of doing a bed bathroom model on their house, uh, because that agency wanted the public to have access to their property. Uh, that's called the, the Nolan versus California Coastal Commission case. The result of that case, I mean, Pat Nolan was able to remodel his house without, you know, giving up an easement over his property because that had nothing to do with the remodel. But every single local government in America today has to go through the legal analysis that the Supreme Court established in the Nolan decision. You know, they, they, they cannot leverage their permitting authority 
um, in order to get something from you for free that they would otherwise have to pay you for. So that's that's the value of strategic litigation. Um, it's uh, very important in, in our case selection that uh, we're able to work with clients who have a very compelling personal story. Uh, and that that's really a, an important part of of uh, engaging in pro bono uh, public interest litigation, because it's not just, as, as Curtis mentioned, you know, sort of the dry ball, you know, whereas and there too for and look up this statute and, you know, if they're for, then we win. I, you know, courts, judges like all of us, you know, they're, they're more uh, interested in human stories than just in, you know, dry legal propositions. And that's one of the things that we do uh, a lot of work to do is, is bring out the way that the, mis, the misguided application of federal environmental law actually harms real people and set that over against the sometimes notional benefits that the, the regulation imposes. Um, we also, through strategic relationships with a lot of organizations, uh, I mean, that's how um, I met Curtis is that, uh, you know, we had a longstanding relationship with, uh, with the Oregon Cattlemen. And um, uh, so to answer your question, Curtis, it was probably while you were on the water committee that you heard of PLF, because we had done three or four different cases for Oregon Cattlemen on different topics. But then, uh, you know, this one came up a couple of years ago and Curtis and I got to working together on it. And um, I mean, one of the things that's important about our clients is that it takes it takes a little something different to stand up to the government and say, look, no, I'm not going to, you know, I think what you're doing to me is wrong or what you're telling me to do is wrong. Um, and you, you take a little bit of personal risk when you do it. You, you, you put your own name and face forward and, um, you know, people worry sometimes about retaliation and things like that. We've got, you know, protections that we, we try to put in place against that. Uh, but it, it does take a certain amount of courage uh, to, to stand up to the government, especially with their resources. And so it's almost universally a very inspiring experience to work with our clients uh, and to hear their stories and, and to really have the privilege of, of representing and speaking for them. Yeah, and I might just chime in real quick, Leah. Don't and and yes, and and that was a concern. Um, um, Tony, you know, brought forward that idea that you know your name is not your it's not going to be confidential. Uh, and you know, with modern technology and Google Maps and all of that, it doesn't take long to figure out who this guy is. And and it, you know, it did cause me to pause for a moment and say, "Gosh, you know, uh, <laughs> I've kind of been known to sometimes a different." Uh, episodes in my life to have a bull, bullseye on my back and I'm thinking gee maybe do I want to increase that bullseye on my back you know I mean but on the flip side of it we have to I mean this is America and I don't want to get uh, you know um, corny or, or uh, tried here but uh, this is what America is about when there's there, when there's wrong that can be imposed upon and you know intentionally from for a wrong agenda it's it's, it's uh, incumbent upon us all to step up and, and say, you know, we can't just roll over for this. This has to be recognized. And the, the original intent, whether it be congressional or regulatory or uh, rulemaking, uh, the original intent, intent needs to go, be gone back to. And that's why I think this uh, Waters of the United States has been so, um, uh, yeah, you know, perverted. The original, I, I mean, my stewardship, I, 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 <laughs> we as ranchers and and farmers, we're right in the forefront of wanting clean water and, and healthy air and, and the, the best management practices. And nobody, you know, I'm, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but agriculture at large is on the cutting edge of uh, improved science and technologies ready to adapt and to improve our practices uh, if, if they're there and they're, they're legitimate. So, and then the other thing that I wanna to touch on real briefly is uh, that side that uh, when Tony came out, the the intermittent stream on my rangeland is is just that it has high um, spring runoff uh, flows and and had incised creek, and this whole uh, 
regulatory overreach or overbroad uh, possible interpretation of it would have impacted my uh, wanting to do stewardship, to uh, do beaver dam analogs and to uh, uh, correct the incised creek and to do plantings and off-stream watering facilities. All of the things that are proven through NRCS technical advice and you know, real science, that these are things that improve the landscape, not only for my financial capacity to raise cattle and to run cattle, but it hugely impacts the sage grouse and the, you know, the, the species that uh, I love sharing my rangeland with, mule deer and that, and, and my rangeland does. I mean, that's one of the big things that, that I'm working through now is uh, I have core habitat for the sage grouse here in, or in Eastern Oregon. And I want to work with with the entities that are truly legitimate and have the best interest in the outcomes, you know, for solutions that way. But and this it, this ruling uh, regulation would really make it so cumbersome that you'd be crazy to even want to do anything with improving the watershed because of the impact of the consequences of of permitting and licensing of uh, the cost. And then the liability of what you could be uh, held, uh, you know, uh, taken to court with, of, of, you know, harming the environment. And that, you know, nothing could be further from the truth of what we, what we were, were doing and, and we continue to do even now. So that's a huge, big part of it. And I guess I just want to emphasize, I don't know how many folks are out there listening, but don't be, don't think this is uh, awareness of, of what this is and what it can do is to your, you can't just go blithely along and think these things are, well, that's just politics or it's going to affect somebody else. You're very sadly mistaken. It could come and bite you in the worst, uh, most uh, extreme way and you never know what hit you. And um, that's why, like you said, Leah, uh, getting involved with organizations and entities that have committees and natural resource and environment it's it's important because you know that's what our organizations are here for to be aware and to be updated and and uh, educated and know what's going on so it's it's really it's not a just a frivolous oh it's never going to bother me kind of a deal it it truly can have devastating impacts to our family ranches Agree with you 100% there, Curtis. And I'm going to tee up our comment section here. If there's any questions out there, please drop them in the comment section. I don't see any yet. Uh, so we're just gonna keep rolling along here, but uh, please do interrupt us with any questions, comments. Maybe you have a story that you'd like to share. We'd love to hear uh, from you all watching out there. But um, you know, as, as Curtis said, so important to get involved if you see wrongs out there that need to be righted, uh, join your organization. It doesn't have to be the U.S. Cattlemen's Association. It can be whichever truly aligns with your values. Although I think if you look into <laughs> what we do as a group, um, you, you'll understand that there's quite a bit of work that's been accomplished already and quite a bit of work that still needs to be done. So we do need as many voices out there um, singing from the same song sheet, really. But uh, I want to go back to the waters of the U.S., the WOTUS, the Clean Water Act. Uh, earlier this year, and, and Tony, cut me off whenever I'm over speaking. Earlier this year, the administration released a new WOTUS rule, and it was applauded by several of the national organizations, including the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. But um, you teamed up with the New Mexico Cattle Growers to kind of push back against that new rule. Am I correct in that? And, and what... What exactly was the issue there? Sorry about that. I was uh, muted, which is an uncommon condition for me. <laughs> we, we did uh, um, file a lawsuit uh, on behalf of the New Mexico cattle growers. And the, the basic thrust of it is this, that um, the, the regulation that the current administration adopted early this year is a significant improvement over prior versions of the of, of these definitions and you know we, we've tried to be clear in uh, in stating that and that's true on two levels I mean it, it um, is a pretty dramatic reform in a legal sense of how 
over broadly the agencies of asserted control uh, over features that the statute has nothing to do with. Also politically, I mean, the, the nerve it takes to make that dramatic a move uh, in, a, uh, in a regulatory reform uh, is, is, is quite high. I mean, it, uh, I think, is uh, an example of remarkable courage uh, from the administration to, uh, uh, to undertake this reform. And in the, so there's really two types of features that, that we're looking at closely in the way that the agencies have been overregulated. One has to do with wetlands and the other has to do with, with tributaries. You know, the small non-navigable creeks and other waterways that feed, you know, larger rivers. Uh, actually, I guarantee you everybody on this, uh, who's watching this knows what a tributary is. So the, the, the Trump administration's regulation is, is quite strong on, on wetlands, although we think there's, you know, some, still some over-regulation on the margins in the way they reformed the federal regulation of wetlands. And of course, states retain authority over the wetlands that the federal government is, is no longer um, regulating, you know, consistent, of course, with limits on those states. The issue we've had is that the, the new regulations, despite uh, some significant reform, still significantly overregulate tributaries uh, by stretching the way that the word navigable is understood, um, the, the, the current regulations, the new ones, uh, still rope in uh, very small, um, you know, uh, very small and very infrequently flowing um, water channels. And, you know, in some technical ways, you know, we've made the argument that um, they actually uh, subject certain uh, small creeks to regulation that weren't previously because you know, they changed the criteria uh, by which they determine if something's regulated or not. And so our view of it is this, that yeah, it's a, it's a very important uh, step, uh, strongly in the right direction, but that the habit of the agencies over the decades has been so, um, has been to so over broadly regulate that, that one big step just isn't enough to bring their exercise of authority back within the statutory limit. Uh, so, you know, that, that organization, New Mexico Cattle Growers, was, uh, was courageous in, in going against the grain, uh, you know, of a lot in the uh, agricultural industry uh, of challenging uh, that. We've made clear that the, you know, the relief we're seeking in that lawsuit is not the elimination of the new rule. And, and we make quite clear in our pleadings that we actually support, that our clients support the new rule. Uh, what we've asked for are, are a couple of very specific uh, changes with, where we think the rule goes uh, beyond, you know, still goes beyond uh, the agency's statutory authority. Uh, and that with those changes, the, the new rule should stay in effect. So it's, a, it's kind of a balancing act, frankly. And uh, I know that uh, our clients have had some questions to answer within the industry about why they're doing that. But, uh, you know, it, it's an example of sticking by your guns when what you're doing may not be, may not be popular, um, either with the government or, or with other people, you know, on your side. Um, but uh, there's an important, I think, um, you know, relationship or balance between uh, you know, advocacy, which brings about regulatory and legislative reform, and litigation, which brings about, you know, reform through the courts. And neither is always the right tool. Uh, there are instances where one is the better tool than another, um, but neither should, should ever be, you know, taken off the table um, and, and, and abandoned. Um, I think citizens in, in protecting their rights and in engaging in self-government uh, have to be ready to speak for themselves uh, and, and say the things that need to be said to our, our legislators, uh, but also have to be ready to, to take agencies to court uh, when that's what's necessary to uh, get the desired outcomes. 
Absolutely. Well, no, thank you for that answer. And, um, you know, you have a lobbyist here talking to you about the importance of lobbying and an attorney talking to you how important litigation is. Kurt, why don't you explain to our followers, uh, followers at home uh, your perspective on that? Where, where is litigation and advocacy? Where do you see their role in bringing about change uh, as the neutral party here? <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, no, well, thanks. Yes, and, and I think it's totally correct. It's like a toolbox. And, you know, the last thing that I want is a contentious atmosphere or animosity. And the thing that, that kind of breaks your heart, seriously, is if, these uh, some of these organizations are, are true to their purpose and mission. Uh, what they want is exactly what I'm what we're providing a stewardship out here. Um, you know, I've often made the comment that that uh, I will visit and have discussions with anyone that will. Uh, the only hard and fast rule that I abide by is they have to uh, agree that I, as an Eastern Oregon rancher, have a right to exist. And if, if that is, if they can agree to that, I will have discussions and conversations to understand their perspective, no matter what, because, but there are uh, organizations out there that do really do want to eliminate the human element from the landscape. And that's not going to, I mean, there's no sense in discussing things with those folks because they have a religious fervor that uh, I classify as a domestic terrorism in my own uh, small world here. But I, I think I wanted to kind of loop back and and maybe uh, expound upon uh, the article that you mentioned that was done by Tri-State Livestock News uh, really well. And it's a, it was an interesting involvement uh, between uh, Governor John Kitzhaber in his first term terms as governor, and then he came back and ran again as governor later on. And it was interesting because both of us had uh, evolved and maybe some of the sharp edged uh, uh, reactions that we had or beliefs were uh, a little bit better understanding. And so um, that's where we want to come to is a relationship of me. I came to an understanding that uh, there were legitimate concerns out there to how the natural resource, the public good of water was being handled and that they weren't necessarily out to kill me, out to destroy my way of life. And so it was quite uh, over a 15, 20 year um, relationship of being involved in politics, realized that we do have, we have much more common ground if they're true to their intended purpose and stated mission that I want clean water. I want the best use of it uh, as they do. I want recreational, I want aquatic habitat maintained wherever I can help and, and do that better, I, I certainly will. And so, but at the same time, um, you know, you wanna work through these things in a, in a uh, civil discourse arena and and come to an understanding and you know that is the best way and that's why uh, the balance between advocacy and litigation has to be there um, advocacy I think and and lobbying or just downright straightforward discussion so the very best to understand the other side's perspective because I as a, as a life I mean I was born and raised on a ranch and so my perspective perspective growing up, was totally on production value of, okay, how do we turn grass into more pounds of beef? How can we make that a achievement? And so consequently you do, I, I'll, I'll admit that I had a tunnel vision of, of what that resource meant and what it meant to me. And it was, it was not right. And so by, by listening and, and being engaged in, in discussions with, with uh, other perspectives, it did give me a better balanced view of it. And consequently, what was really nice and really quite, um, what I say, um, uh, a great gift, I guess, of the friendship that, that Governor John Kitzhaber and I developed through through those years. And we're very close right now, even though our political perspectives will never be on the same, same wavelength. Uh, the respect and recognition that both sides had legitimate concerns and were honest and heartfelt in driving for mm -hmm. a common ground and, and a common good for uh, you know, all, all of the different um, philosophies out there was really, uh, really, a, 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 for me personally, was really quite uh, a, uh, a life-changing event to, to realize that we had, you know, and, but there again, uh, you have to come to the table and, and the people that you're discussing with, there has to be an honesty and an, and an integrity brought forward that there's not uh, hidden agendas and um, 
like some of these uh, extremist organizations, and I guess that would be one argument that I have with Tony, is they cannot be called environmental organizations. They really are extremist, or some of them are. Uh, some of them are extremist organizations that have a litigious point of view that it's a, it's a methodology of them promoting their uh, base and promoting a financial um, uh, pr uh, stability for their organization. Their true, sometimes their true motivation isn't very worthy. But the ones that are, the ones that are legitimately concerned about the stewardship of the resource and the, and the landscape, those are the folks that we can come together with and, and make progress to go forward and, and, and have a, uh, you know, a unifying um, uh, resource management perspective of, of how to do this. And so I continually strive and work toward that. And it's, 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 it's a lot of fun. It's uh, time consuming. But it is very worthwhile that that folks come together, and uh, you know I don't want to denigrate uh, Tony's profession as as my oldest son happens to be an attorney, but uh, you, you know that's you know the the methodology there not, definitely has to be used at times, but it's, it's much better to come together in discussions and forthright, honest conversations to to understand each other before it gets to that point. But there again, you have agencies that um, have uh, in, in them people that may have agendas that want to drive forward and pervert that original uh, worthy intent and, and be misguided in how to enforce those uh, implementations on, on folks that uh, is, is outside their limit, uh, is outside the designed authority of what that original uh, you know, reasoning was. Well, I was going to ask you your thoughts and your take-home message, but I can't think of a more inspirational message for folks to leave here with tonight. So thank you for that. Um, really do appreciate it. We don't have any other questions in the comment box. Um, I've checked both Facebook and YouTube. I'll give you guys another few minutes here, but I'm sure with the election and uh, folks have had enough to keep themselves busy this week. So maybe we'll get some more views over the weekend and get some more questions there. And I'm sure... Um, we can forward those to Tony too, if, if anything comes up over the weekend. But um, mm -hmm. for those of you listening live, um, you've got a few more minutes here. How about, we'll, we'll go to Tony now. Tony, what should viewers kind of go home with today? What's the take home message from our conversation this evening? Well, I would say, you know, this is, this is the big thing that there's there's really two kinds of ways of thinking about you know the you know sort of the Goldilocks question about about regulation and government too much too little just right one is kind of a um, an ideological one you know big is always bad or small is always bad but the other is is um, kind of a, a principled one which is we're going to have to have somebody who makes these decisions, right? So the question then is who, what's the, you know, what's our system for choosing who does that or, or empowering the people who do that. And a lot of the work that we do at Pacific Legal Foundation, a lot of the experience that our clients are having in dealing with agencies is that in civics class as youngsters, we, we hear this, that we elect Congress to make the laws and the executive branch has agencies to implement those laws. And so we're quite surprised when we find out that agencies kind of do whatever they want to do. And that's based on a very long cultural practice of Congress. Uh, instead of actually making real rules, uh, adopting laws that have these generally aspirational purposes go forth and cause clean water, go forth and cause, you know, protection of endangered wildlife. And agency staff, you, you make up the details, okay? And so I think a lot of what we do is help people who would prefer the constitutional system for that, where the, the elected legislators make the rules because they're the ones who are accountable to us. They're the ones who can be voted out of office if they make incompetent uh, or, um, you know, or just dumb rules. Uh, 
Um, they're the ones that actually have to look over their shoulder and see how what they're doing affects people. And, you know, a lot of that um, happens through the kind of relationship that, that Kurt described with, uh, uh, with John Kitzhaber, you know, because elected uh, legislators have to know their constituents. The more they outsource the, the rulemaking to, to agency staff who don't have to know, you know, anybody, um, the less accountable the legislature is and the less accountable the agencies are. And so I think that's a, just a general theme we, we find in a lot of our work. There's legal principles that we use to argue against that kind of, you know, agency um, excess, okay? But, but that's really the theme that runs through it, is that Americans, we expect to be able to elect the rule makers and hold the executive branch to the same laws that we have to live with. And a lot of our clients' experience is executive branch agency staff who make up the rules, enforce the rules, and can actually change the rules to, to make sure they win when, when that's what's necessary. Um, that's our, our very common experience, in, especially in Clean Water Act enforcements. And so when, when you're having that experience, wait a second, <laughs> I, 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 can, I can read the text of a statute just like any other person, you know, of, of basic education. Um, this doesn't say you get to do what you're trying to do to me. Give us a call because that's the, that's the kind of help we're trying to give people. Yeah, I'd just like to chime in real quick, Leah, and, and really encourage folks to get to know uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. Get on their website, look at the, what they're doing, and look at their past history and and you'll really be appreciative of, of what they've done. And, and I can tell you, attest personally, that how great they are to work with and uh, uh, the interest. If, if they sink their teeth into something, they're, they're not going to jump ship halfway through when the going gets tough. They're going to understand it and, and visit it and, and, and know it thoroughly. And I guess while I need to be doing my part as a board member of U.S. Cattlemen's to do the same with U.S. Cattlemen's Association. We're there. We're totally member, represented member um, uh, policy, no outside interests uh, for corporate or anything. So both entities, uh, please, if there's folks out there that don't know uh, U.S. Cattlemen's, um, please get to know us and ask us questions because we are very vibrant and we're here for the American cattle cattle producer that's for, for sure so anyway thanks now thank you thanks for joining us for facts only friday we always have so much fun on these and i personally learn a lot more this is an area that uh you know being from a suburban metro area i don't get i didn't grow up learning too much about so it's always great to to dive deeper into these issues and um just wanted to thank everybody for joining us for facts only friday Take some time as we've got an election in progress in this country. Take some time to unplug this weekend and then join USCA next Tuesday. We're going to host a horn wrap call at 7 a.m. Mountain where we're going to debrief what the election means for cattle country. So I think that's all for us today. We'll go ahead and link some more information on both Pacific Legal Foundation and the U.S. Cattlemen's Association in this post here. So thank you all for joining and uh, have a good rest of your night. <laughs>